Hello, and welcome to the dungeon. I'm your host, Rob. And in today's video, we're going to be looking at the Abjurer Wizard. Now, this is partly because I realize that I'm way behind on my wizard subclasses, but also because I really like the Abjurer. And I had an interesting idea on how to maybe push it even further. Now, the Abjurer is basically like the anti-magic magic guy. That's really what it is. And if you look at all their abilities, they're all designed around like controlling or shutting down damage. And so if you want a defensive caster, this is a really solid choice. And there's nothing stopping you from still taking a bunch of damage spells or whatever. You know, that's perfectly fine. And I do think that um, the Abjur is a class that you can just play all the way from 1 to 20. It's going to be really solid. It's going to be fine. Nothing wrong with that. Just take a lot of Abjuration spells and you'll probably be good. But I do think that the way the Arcane Ward works is there's definitely ways we can try to like maximize its potential. And to me, Arcane Ward is one of the big draws of the class. So that's one of the things we're going to look at towards the end of the video. So this video is probably going to be a little shorter, but you know, that's okay. I need short videos too. I have too many like 50 minutes. <laughs> um, so at level two, you're going to get your Abjuration Savant. Every class or wizard subclass, sorry, gets that, you know, Divination Savant, Evocation Savant, whatever. Just means that you're going to be able to scribe those type of spells in your spell book for half cost. But the big draw is your Arcane Ward. So starting at level two, you're going to get a magical ward that absorbs twice your wizard level plus your int mod worth of hit points. So if you're level two, you're going to get four hit points plus your intelligence modifier. We'll assume you have 16 intelligence, so that's another plus three. So you're going to have a seven hit point shield. And the shield does not temporary hit points and it's not an increased hit point maximum. So it actually stacks with both of those. So if you had, like, say, a bard in the party who took Inspirational Leader, and now you've got temporary hit points, and then you have a cleric who casts, say, Aid, so your temporary hit point maximum, is, or your hit point maximum has been increased, and you have your ward, you can layer all three of those defenses on, and you're going to be really, really beefy and tough, which is very nice, because wizards are generally not very beefy or tough. <laughs> um, whenever the ward is depleted, though, or whenever you cast a... Uh, the, the ward doesn't go away when it's depleted, so unless you take a long rest. But uh, even when it's reduced to zero, it's still there. And when you cast an abjuration spell, it recovers the spell level times two worth of hit points. So if you cast, you know, the alarm spell, for example, or a shield spell, both of which are level one, you're going to get two hit points back to your ward. So if you're level 20, for example, and you have 40 hit points on your ward plus your mod, We'll assume you have 20 intelligence by then. That's a 45 hit point shield. That's a significant amount of damage. So I'm going to talk to more, more in the future about this, but just think about like, that's a lot of absorption potential right there. And that's really, to me, that's the main draw of this class. At level six, you're going to have the ability to use your reaction to put your ward on another creature within 30 feet of you. So if he takes damage, you can use your reaction to put the ward on them, and the ward will absorb the damage instead. I'm probably still looking to mostly use the ward for myself, but if you have, like, you know, if the paladin is trying to just tank away on the front line, and then the, you know, fire giant lands that critical hit on it, and you're like, ooh, uh, that could be bad, you know, you might want to throw your ward onto the paladin and, you know, save them from going down. That could be very handy. Um, but in general, I'm probably still looking to use it on myself. The majority of the time. At level 10 you get improved abjuration so whenever you have to make a like ability check on, as part of casting a spell like the spell magic or counter spell you get to add your proficiency mod to the dice roll instead of just your ability mod. So this makes it a lot more likely that you're going to be able to land a counter spell which is awesome because if you've ever been in high level campaigns and the big bad decides to throw a force cage on the barbarian and the fighter that's a game changer right there. And if you don't manage to counterspell that, your party could be in for a world of hurt. So the ability to uh, actually counter those spells more effectively when you really need to is amazing. Um, if anybody ever watched Critical Role, basically the big finale was them fighting Vecna. And to me, the highlight of the entire episode was watching the Bard Scanlan constantly try to reposition himself so he could be within counterspell distance of Vecna. 
And, and then Vecna constantly trying to get out of range, so this annoying bard doesn't keep counterspelling him. And, you know, the big finale is that he tries to... But spoilers! Okay, even warned. The big finale is Vecna tries to teleport away, and Scanlan, because he doesn't want to fail the spell, well, he ends up using a ninth level spell to counterspell the teleport, and then didn't have a ninth level spell slot to save his buddy like he was hoping to. And it was very emotional, and it was very awesome. But... You might be able to avoid that because, uh, you know, you can add your proficiency bonus to the roll and not have to sacrifice your wish spell. Um, at level 14, you get spell resistance. So you have advantage on all saving throws against spells. And you have resistance against the damage of all spells. So basically, if you've ever had a Oath of the Ancients Paladin in your party, uh, you know how good half damage from all spells is. You basically have that for yourself permanently, and you have resistance against spells. So advantage and half damage. It's ridiculously good, and it means that enemy casters are really basically just a joke. Like, you... I mean, you still can counterspell them for the ward, but you don't even have to at this point, almost, you know? They're like, oh, they're casting a chain lightning on the party. You're like, eh, okay, I guess I'll counterspell it, you know? But if I don't, I'm still taking half damage, and I've got advantage anyway, so I don't you know, and if they're hitting you, then you're like, bah, whatever. Finger death, pff, I don't care. No big deal. Disintegrate? <laughs> come on, come on. Who are you, who are you talking to here? Don't, don't you know that I'm an abjurer wizard? Come on. So, those are the abjuration abilities. Um, like I said, I think the abjurer is pretty solid. As for the ward, I have seen a lot of people just suggest things like taking the alarm spell, for example. And since it's a ritual, you can cast it out of combat and use that to refresh your ward. That's a little cheesy, but, you know, I, if I was a dungeon master, I wouldn't really care. I'd allow it. However, there are a lot of time constraints involved. Because if you cast something as a ritual, it adds 10 minutes to the casting time. Now, that's fine if your ward only has, say, 7 or 10 hit points. But, like I said before, if you're level 20 and your ward is... 45 hit points, and you're trying to recharge it two hit points at a time with a spell that's casting in excess of 10 minutes, uh, that's kind of a no-go <laughs> no for me. Like, you're going to have to spend so much time just trying to recharge your ward. That's ex essentially half your adventuring day. So, to me, I'm going to want a better way to do it. And one of the problems we find with a lot of the abjuration magic, not all of it, but a lot of the best abjuration spells tend to be things like shield, absorb elements, counterspell, dispel magic. And in all of those cases, it's not like you can just have a game plan of, okay, I'm going to cast, uh, you know, absorb elements in this fight, or I'm going to cast counterspell three times in this fight. Because you don't know, maybe you're just fighting a bunch of stuff that never casts spells, and so you never have anything to counter or to dispel. That kind of stuff happens, you know? And shield's a great spell, not trying to knock shield. But again, it's a first level spell, same with the Absorb Elements. And so if you try to recharge your ward like that, it kind of becomes very difficult. So one of the things I was thinking about when I looked through the Abjuration spells is I had one immediate standout, and that was Armor of Agathis, or Agathis, however it's pronounced. I call it Agathis, but whatever. So, the thing that's crazy about that spell is, again, it's only a first level spell, but it's one of the rare cases where the higher level spell slot you use to cast it, just the more amazing it becomes. Unlike, say, Fireball, where it starts to, you know, you start increasing the spell level by a lot, but you increase the damage by a little tiny bit. This just becomes better and better and better and better. So if you cast over, say, a fifth level spell slot, you're going to recharge 10 hit points to the ward, and it's going to last an hour. And the best part is, because it's not temporary hit points, because it's a completely different damage source entirely, it's going to work with Armor of Agathis. So if somebody hits you, and we'll say, use that example, say you have a fifth level Armor of Agathis on yourself, they're going to take 25 points of cold damage reflected back to them. But the damage you take is going to come from the ward first. And this has actually been clarified by Wizards of the Coast that the ward takes the damage first, then the temporary hit points if you have any, then hit points. So in the previous example, let's say you had, you know, 
uh, a paladin or a cleric that had cast eight on you, and you you have your own armor of Agathus on you, and then you have the ward. The ward's going to go first, then they have to beat their way through armor of Agathus, and then you've got the increased hit point total, so your hit points are even above the regular amount. And, you know, you can just recast an armor of Agathus at this point, which is also going to recharge your ward. <laughs> and I really, really, the more I thought about it, I really liked this combo, because it's a great spell in general, but it's even more effective when it's not taking the damage. And last week I did a video talking about the Barbarian Warlock multiclass, and we talked about how Armor of Agathus got so much more mileage out of a Raging Barbarian who's only taking half damage, but you're still reflecting the full damage back based on the spell level. This has that same ability where the ward's taking the damage, but you're reflecting the damage back, and then you can like cast, you know, maybe somebody did cast something, and you cast a counter spell, that's going to help recharge the ward. So now they're going to be taking, you know, means that the ward's just going to last longer and your armor of Agathus is going to last longer and it's going to be reflecting even more damage. And if it goes down, like I said, you can recast it, which will automatically recharge the ward as well. It's actually just an amazing combo. In fact, it's so good that, like, the more I thought about it, the more I wanted to actually play this kind of class. I do this a lot to myself, though, you know. I've got so many ideas for classes to play and so few games to play them in. But, uh... I really, really like this combo. So, I think, obviously, you could just take one level of Warlock. I think that's a fine choice if you want to multi-class. I'd probably only take one level. I don't really care about Eldritch Blast in this case. I'm not looking for any of the actual Warlock abilities, really. I'm just looking for this spell. But, I do think that Hexblade, giving you medium armor and a shield, isn't necessarily a bad way to go. I think that probably offers more for a one level dip than say the Fiend or some of the others. I think I think it's pretty decent. Um, if I was going to take the one level, I might also just want to pick up something like say uh, Hellish Rebuke if I'm taking one level of Warlock. And I think that's a decent reaction spell as well. Because with this build, I maybe not wanting to use Shield as much. Because if I'm trying to reflect damage back with the ward, shield's just going to make me less likely to get hit. But this will give me a reaction spell where if they hit me, I can do some damage back to them. Now, obviously my charisma save might not be very good. Because I'm not, I'm not caring about charisma that much, right? If I have 13 and that's enough to multi-class in and out of Warlock, that's fine. You know, 14, whatever it is of being. Um, so I don't really care about that so much. It does mean that I'm going to have a weak charisma save probably for my spell save DC, but Hellish Rebuke's still going to do half damage. And Hellish Rebuke's kind of more an add-on. It's more like you hit me, you took a bunch of thorns damage basically from Armor of Agathus, and now I'm going to use my reaction to do even more damage on you for hitting me. Like, how dare you? Don't you know who I am? I'm an immature. Um, so I think that's kind of a fun idea. And like I said, medium armor and a shield is pretty decent for just a one-level multi-class. You're getting quite a bit there. And funnily enough, it's not what I'm normally looking for from a Hexblade. Usually, I'm trying to grab stuff like the Charisma instead of my Strength or Dex for an attack roll kind of thing. Uh, I'm not looking to make a lot of sword attacks on this guy, even if I take one-level Hexblade. I'm just looking to be a wizard who casts spells like any other wizard. Except I'm doing it in medium armor, medium armor and a shield, making me even tougher and more durable, which just kind of fits the whole idea of this character. So I kind of like that idea. But if you don't want a multi-class, you could just take the Magic Initiate feat. And I mean, if you went Variant Human, you could start with Magic Initiate. And then you could just grab a couple cantrips and, uh, you know, take Armor of Agathus as your first level spell. And I think that's really solid as well. Um... So those are my main thoughts on it. Like I said, I'm not looking for a multi-class. And any time I play a wizard, even if I do multi-class, in general, I'm not looking to take any more than three levels of a class. Otherwise, I'm going to lose my ninth level spells. Now, if I'm playing like an Eldritch Knight, and then I decide to multi-class into a wizard, that's kind of a different story. Because I'm thinking of myself as an Eldritch Knight, not as a wizard who just picked up three levels of fighter. You know? So, that's a little different there. But if I'm looking to primarily be a wizard and I want to play like a wizard, then I'm always going to want to get 
ninth level spells, or at least the potential, right? Maybe the campaign doesn't go that far, but even still, pushing back your spell progression by a lot is really detrimental to wizards, you know? And the nice thing about this is that you can get that combination, you know, you could start as a level one warlock if you wanted, but you don't need to, you know? You could multi-class in after you get like third level spells, for example. You could, so you get to level five and then you're like, okay, now I'm gonna grab my one level of Hexblade. And because it's a bonus proficiency for your armor and your shield, you're gonna get them both anyways. It, you know, the, the multi-classing rules and the restrictions and stuff aren't gonna matter because this is an actual class ability. You get to be able to use medium armor and a shield. And I really like the, the way that those two relate to one another. So anyways, I think those are my thoughts on this class. Uh, kind of a shorter video, but that's okay. I've got lots of like 45 and 50 minute videos out there. Um, it's kind of nice to have one that's a little shorter. But feel free to like, subscribe, and of course, leave comments in the comment section. That's my favorite thing. I love reading your comments. Um, I'd love to hear about your uh, you know, uh, examples of having played this class. Maybe you've got some stories to tell. Or maybe you're like, hey, I played an Abjurer Wizard, and I kind of found the same thing as you were saying. Like, the, most of my good spells, I couldn't really, like, prepare them, you know, to use to recharge the ward. It's like, if somebody casts a spell on me, I can counter it or whatever. You know, or maybe you're like, yeah, actually, I played one, one to 20, and I thought they were great and never had a problem with it. Because that's the thing. I haven't actually played the class, like I said, right? I saw somebody else play one, but it was only low level. And, uh, you know, these are just my thoughts and opinions. And... I do think that Abjurer is one of these cases where you can just play straight out of the book of Abjurer, 1 to 20, and it'll probably be great. But I like the idea of trying to like get even more out of the ward, and I think this is a decent way to do it. So anyways, those are my thoughts. I'll see you next time in the dungeon.